My name is Stephanie Bernard and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Melbourne. I'm going to talk today about telescopes and how we use them to get information about astrophysical sources. So, The slides visible. Okay, so just a bit about me to start off. So I'm a PhD student here at Melbourne, as I mentioned. Uh, I grew up in Newcastle in New South Wales. Uh, where I was lucky enough to be able to go and visit the telescopes in central New South Wales at parks. And I thought that was really, really exciting. So I decided to do my undergraduate in physics, moved to Melbourne at the end of high school. So I did my work experience week at the University of Melbourne in the group here. And I thought it was very, very cool. Everyone was really excited about the work they were doing. And so I decided to come here. I then did my masters um, at Melbourne looking at stars that explode in the early universe and continued for my PhD where I look for the very first galaxies that formed in the universe. Along the way I've been lucky enough to use a lot of different telescopes both in Australia and around the world and so I'm very excited to talk about them today. So just to start off, um, the first telescopes were invented in the 1600s in the Netherlands by uh, microscope makers. So they were very very small, only a few centimetres across. They use lenses to bend the light, so they're called refracting telescopes. And this is an example of one of Galileo's telescopes that he used. You can see that it's very, very long, but actually it's only a few centimetres in diameter. So refracting telescopes need to be very, very long to be able to focus the light. Um, they're a bit unwieldy though if you try and make larger uh, telescopes on the orders of 10 to 20 centimetres. They can be up to 6 or 7 metres across uh, along. So Galileo improved the first telescope designs and with the, his new telescope he could discover uh, a lot of interesting things about our solar system. He discovered four moons around Jupiter in 1610 and we, we now call these the Galilean moons. And this was really important because this was the first discovery of objects in the solar system orbiting around something that wasn't uh, the Earth. Uh, before this they thought that everything in the solar system including the Sun orbited around the Earth. Uh, there were ideas from Copernicus and others that actually the Earth revolved around the Sun. And this discovery of moons around Jupiter was really helpful in, in actually providing evidence for this new idea. Um, he also used his telescope to look at the Moon and looked at the patches of light and dark on the Moon and saw that they changed over time. And from this he could actually deduce that these dark and light patches were due to cratering on the Moon, so actually that some parts of the Moon were at lower, uh, were lower than others due to, due to craters. So Newton then improved the design of telescopes and discovered that you could use mirrors to bounce the light um, around. And with this actually you can use, uh, you can make telescopes that are much larger and much shorter because you can actually send the light back on itself. And this almost halves the distance that your uh, telescope, the length that your telescope has to be. This is really useful. Um, we actually use these designs these days in modern telescopes and we can make telescopes very, very big. The largest telescopes that we use today for modern astrophysics are 8 to 10 meters in diameter. Any larger than this, and actually the glass is too heavy, and the glass will sag and deform. Um, so if we want to have bigger telescopes than this, we actually have to use lots of smaller mirrors altogether. This is some examples of some of the largest telescopes in use today. The Keck 10 meter telescopes, which you can see have smaller mirrors that are all joined together, and the VLT 8 meter telescope, which is one single piece of glass that's 8 meters across. It's very, very large. So let's talk about light. So light is both a particle, which we call a photon, and a wave, which we call electromagnetic radiation. So different energies of light, different uh, photons have different energies, and this means that they have different wavelengths, which is the distance from the peak of one wave to the next, and different frequencies, which is the number of waves that you have per second. So the wavelength and the frequency are related by the speed of light, which is a constant. So if we have our electromagnetic spectrum, we go from high energy, which is gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet rays, through to low energy, which is 
through the optical, which is the coloured uh, portion of the spectrum that you can see, into the infrared, microwave and radio waves. So you can see that as the energy increases towards the gamma rays, we have increasing frequency, so we have more waves per second, but the wavelength decreases, so the amount, so the distance between different waves decreases. Whereas we go to longer waves, like radio waves, the wave can actually be very, very long, several meters um, across. So this is something to keep in mind. And if we look at our telescope, we have some important uh, features of our telescope that we want to know about. And resolution is really one of the most important ones because this tells us the smallest things on the sky that we can see with this telescope. So we call this the angular resolution. It's represented by theta, which is the circle with the lines through it. And this theta um, depends on both the wavelength of the light and the diameter of the telescope. So if we increase the diameter of our telescope, then we increase the number on the bottom of this equation and our number, our theta angle gets smaller, which means that we can see smaller and smaller things on the sky. So larger diameters are better for seeing small things. If we increase the wavelengths, so if we go from say optical wavelengths to radio wavelengths, our wavelength increases and this increases the angle uh, that we can see. So if we want to look at longer wavelengths, we need larger diameters to get the same angular resolution. So if we have optical telescopes, where we're looking at wavelengths that are around several hundred nanometers, our telescopes are a few meters in diameter. As I mentioned, our largest telescopes are around 8 to 10 meters in diameter. When we look at radio telescopes, though, these telescopes are much larger. They can be several dozen meters to even hundreds of meters in diameter. On the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales is a good example of this. Its dish is 64 meters across. It's very, very large. And actually, with radio telescopes, we can use a technique called interferometry and so this is where we use two radio telescopes that are separated by some distance together at the same time and we can create a telescope which has the same area as the distance between them so if we put radio telescopes on the opposite sides of the earth we're effectively making a telescope that's the same diameter as the earth and we can get very 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 good resolution doing this it's very exciting <laughs> So if we're on the ground, as we often are, we have to look through the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is very good because it means that we can breathe, but when we're trying to look at things in space, it's actually a bit annoying because if we have an object like a star or a galaxy, which is sending out light from us, when it hits the atmosphere, the atmosphere is really turbulent. We know on the ground that we have wind, where the air is sort of moving around, and this sort of effect is happening in the upper atmosphere as well. So the upper atmosphere, everything is moving around, and that means that the light that hits the atmosphere, it actually gets sent out in lots of different directions and it gets uh, spread out. So we call this blurring of the light uh, seeing, and this is really an important effect in how well we can actually resolve uh, things on the ground. We also have a problem if we're on the ground because the atmosphere is only transparent to certain wavelengths. So we know that optical light can get through the atmosphere, we can see with our eyes, and also uh, radio waves can get through. But things like ultraviolet light uh, is blocked, which is good because that means that we don't get cancer, <laughs> skin cancer. Um, but also molecules like water in the atmosphere absorb infrared light, and so that light also can't get through. But we know that astrophysical objects emit light at lots of different wavelengths, so we do want to still see the light that is at these wavelengths, we just can't do it from the ground. So what we do is we go to space instead. And this is really good because these space-based telescopes can detect wavelengths that are blocked by the atmosphere. And also because they're above the atmosphere, they don't have that blurring effect from the atmosphere. So we get better resolution for a smaller telescope that's in space than we do for the same size telescope on the ground. So this is really exciting. Of course, it costs a lot of money to send telescopes into space. So this is sort of one of the drawbacks of it. But, of course, we've sent some up, and these are some examples and the different uh, wavelengths that they look at. So we have all the way from gamma ray telescopes, the Fermi telescope, the Chandra X-ray observatory, which observes X-rays, the SWIFT telescope, which follows up very energetic um, explosions in gamma rays and, and ultraviolet rays, the Hubble Space Telescope, which has lots of different instruments, and it can observe both ultraviolet, it can observe optical wavelengths as well, and it also observes in the infrared. And then the Spitzer the Space Telescope, which observes longer infrared wavelengths, and the Herschel Space Observatory, which is now no longer uh, running, which observed longer infrared wavelengths. So all these telescopes uh, can observe different parts of the spectrum and give us a much better idea of uh, how sources in the universe uh, emit light.
So when we're taking observations, we can take generally two different types of observations. If we take an image of the sky, sort of like with a camera, then this tells us some important information such as where the sources are on the sky. So this is an example of the Hubble Deep Field, which is taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And in here we can see lots and lots of different galaxies. There are actually around 10,000 galaxies in this image. And uh, if we use filters to only look at certain wavelengths, then we can actually take images in lots of different filters. And then we know at particular wavelengths only uh, the, this amount of light is coming through. And then if we put those uh, images in different filters all back together, we can make what's called a multicolored image, which you can see here in the Hubble image. So this is a, uh, a very, very small patch of sky. If you held out a grain of sand at arm's length, this is the amount of sky that it would cover. Again, you, you can see, even just from this one image, that there are so many galaxies in the universe. And they all have different colors, which tells us about the different types of stars that are in each galaxy. Um, they might have gas or dust in them. So we can tell a lot of things just using images. If we split the light into its different wavelengths, then we get what's called a spectrum of the galaxy. And so in this example, you can see that there's sort of a general curve that the light follows. But on top of the curve at certain points, there are spikes that come up. And then there are dips that go down from that, that general baseline. And so these are called emission lines for the ones that stick up and absorption lines for the ones that dip down. And these lines are caused by different elements, uh, such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, lots of different things. And if we look at a galaxy and we look at the uh, height of these peaks, we can actually tell how much of these elements is in this galaxy in the stars. So this is a really important way of um, finding out what's inside galaxies um, that we can't do with, with images. So when we take astrophysical data, we use both of these approaches together, imaging and spectroscopy, to get image information about these sources. We do generally the imaging first, which tells us where sources are, and then we use follow-up spectroscopy that tells us what the source is made of, we can use it to tell how far away it is, and lots of important things. So if we want to actually make a, a you know, some discovery about galaxies, we generally perform what's called a survey, and to do this we use telescopes. So we could have a telescope which is dedicated to one single survey, so all the time that that telescope has at night is used to just do one particular survey. And an example of this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is surveying the northern hemisphere, and it's looked at around a million galaxies uh, and figured out where they are, how far away they are, lots of important uh, things. Our other approach could be that we could take a telescope, which is open to any astronomer. Um, we say we want to look at these particular type of galaxies for this long. We want to look at this many, many galaxies. Um, and if uh, if that's approved, if that seems like a good idea, then we can use part of the telescope's time to look at just this one particular type of galaxy. Um, whereas something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey will look at everything and try and build up. Um, it's more general. Basically. So if I go a little bit into my research, uh, we can talk about why space telescopes are really important. So if we're in the Milky Way and we're looking out with our telescopes, we see that there are galaxies all over the sky. Some are very close to us, such as, such as the Andromeda Galaxy, which is our nearest large neighbour. And as we look out, we see more and more galaxies. And when we look at enough galaxies, you know, several tens of thousands to millions, we see that they have this particular pattern across the sky, where if we have one galaxy, we're more likely to see galaxies nearby, and so galaxies are what we call clustered. And then we also have regions where there are very few galaxies called voids. And this happens all over the entire sky, and we can actually use this pattern of where the galaxies are to test our fundamental theories of how the universe began and evolved. This is a very pretty video, I'll let it just play a little bit longer. So this here is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data set, so almost a million galaxies. Hopefully you can see that sort of closer into where we are in the centre, we have lots of galaxies, but then as we go out, and here going out means that we're going, looking back into the universe's history, we see that there are very, very, very few galaxies. So my uh, research is on looking for these very, very early galaxies, sort of at the edges of where this image are. 
And the reason that we want to use space telescopes to do this is because we know that our universe is expanding. So the way that this happens is that if we're in the Milky Way and we're looking out at galaxies, we see the galaxies that are closer to us, they move away with some speed. And the galaxies that are further away from us, they move much faster. And so this is not that we're in the center of the universe and everything is moving out. It's just that the whole universe is expanding. So if we move to a different galaxy, we would see exactly the same effect, where the close by galaxies have some speed and the further away galaxies are moving much faster. This is called Hubble's Law. So what this does to the light that we're seeing from these galaxies is that if a galaxy is emitting light, and it might be very blue light from young stars, we know that the speed of light is constant. So even though the light is emitted, emitted at blue wavelengths, because the universe is expanding, the wavelength of the, the photon gets stretched out and it becomes greener and then it becomes redder as the space expands even more. So when we're looking for the first galaxies in the universe, even though light might be emitted at ultraviolet wavelengths, so even more energetic than blue light that we see with our eyes, it actually gets stretched so much that it falls into infrared wavelengths, which we can't see from the ground. We need to use space telescopes to see this. So I'll just finish with a little bit about how telescopes allow us to see into the future. We can tie some of these concepts together. So if we look with just our eyes, so our eyes are very, very small. The retina that detects uh, light is only a few square centimeters across in our eyes, which means that we can't detect that many photons. The furthest thing we can see is the Andromeda galaxy, which is around two and a half million light years away. If we move to a consumer telescope, which is a bit larger, it might be 10 or 20 centimeters across, we can collect more light, but we're not storing the light. We need actually a camera which is something that an astron astronomical telescope has. And so the largest uh, that we have at the moment is the Hubble Space Telescope, which can see almost to the Big Bang, around 500 million years after the Big Bang. And the only light that we can see further than that is actually radio light. This is the afterglow of the Big Bang, and it's called the Cosmic Microwave Background. So that's all I had in my presentation. If we have questions, I can answer them now. Bring you back.
With the SKA telescope, we actually see at radio wavelengths. And this is really important because uh, with the radio wavelengths, we can see a particular emission that hydrogen makes. And so we think that in the very early universe, between around 100 million to a billion years after the Big Bang, the universe was just filled with hydrogen. There were very, very few stars and galaxies. So looking at this hydrogen is really the only way that we can see what was in the universe at that time. So with the SKA, we want to see basically where the hydrogen is in the universe, how much there is, um, and uh, that's one of the things. We can also see galaxies that are sort of closer to us, and we can look at low frequency, low, sorry, yes, low frequencies that these galaxies emit, and that will give us more information that we don't currently have as well. So there was a question about how many telescopes are currently observing space. So the answer is a lot. Um, we have lots of very large telescopes uh, that are uh, situated around the world, generally in mountain ranges such as in Chile, in Hawaii, in the Canary Islands. Um, these range from around 2 to 4 to even larger, 8 to 10 metres in size. Uh, in terms of space telescopes, which are actually in space, there are maybe 10 or so. Um, some of them uh, previously were observing, but um, because it's sort of difficult to get up to telescopes, they generally have a very limited lifetime, you know, maybe three to five years. The Hubble Space Telescope is sort of different because the US shuttle program meant that it could be upgraded periodically, um, but since the shuttle is no longer working, Hubble is sort of in its last few years of observing. So there's a question, what is the name of the telescope that has replaced Hubble? So the telescope that's currently being built in the US and in Europe is called the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is uh, sort of the successor to Hubble. It's a bit different though. So Hubble is a 2.4 meter uh, mirror for its telescope, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna be six and a half meters across. So that means that the area is around nine times greater. So it will be able to see a bit deeper and uh, it also is more designed to work at infrared wavelengths, which are those wavelengths that we can't see from the ground. And so with this, we can see light from the very early universe, and we can also see light from planets that are being formed around stars, sort of in our more local um, universe, and also very uh, interesting things. So that's gonna be launching later this year, actually. And then the first observations will start being taken on that telescope next year. So there was another question, do you think we'll ever be able to see beyond 46 billion light years? So I don't think so. So the, the earliest light that we can see is from around 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That's called the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and so before that, actually, the, the light that was in the universe, uh, it kept being bounced off uh, energetic particles that were in the very, very young, hot universe. And so actually the light couldn't really escape. This cosmic microwave background is the first time that light could actually flow through the universe without being uh, impeded. So, yeah, so that's really the, the, the furthest that we can see in the universe.
right. Any more questions before I go? A couple more minutes. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I had a really good time. I hope that was useful for you in learning a bit about telescopes. I'm going to sign off now. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you want to talk to me on Twitter, my username is astro underscore Steffi. I'm very, very happy to talk more about telescopes uh, there. Thanks. Mm -hmm.